Hey everybody, welcome to another Screenwriter's Tips. My name is Tony D. Uh, today we're going to talk about the process a little bit, how to get started, and how to finish up. Now it's a very broad, I mean you can get very detailed on this, so I'm going to try to give you some broad strokes, especially if you're just starting out. This is this is mainly what my videos are for. I mean, if you're a seasoned screenwriter, you're looking at this advice and going, oh, duh. Uh, but for a lot of people who are just starting out, it, it's tough. It's tough to get started and it's tough to know what to do. Um, the first thing you should do is when you, well, you have to distinguish between two kinds of jobs. One is a job you have for uh, a work for hire gig. And one is something that you're basically writing on spec for yourself to hopefully sell uh, to a producer. Now, if you're writing for uh, hire, it's about cranking the words out. And I don't say that to, you know, denigrate the, the client, but the client wants what they want. And you can't get too caught up on the, the artistic merit of what you're doing. You wanna, you wanna do good work, but the client, calls the shots and ultimately you can give them good advice but if they want to drive the project off a cliff you just have to wave and say thanks for the paycheck um, there's nothing you can do there's nothing you can do about a client who's determined to ruin his own screenplay and doesn't want to listen to your advice I dealt with a few of them you know you just got to be polite and just say okay I disagree with that but we'll move ahead okay now, most people watching this video isn't, are interested about learning to write their own screenplay because they have a story burning inside them or whatever. They've always wanted to write a screenplay or they have an idea or they think they're gonna make money. Okay, so first your idea. Where do you get your inspiration from? It could be from anywhere. Everybody's process is a little different. You know, for me, it's, it's very sort of random. Sometimes I get an idea when I'm talking to somebody or you know, I'm just at home watching TV or playing a video game or having a sandwich. Could be at any time, any place. Um, a lot of times I feel that inspiration will come from new experiences. So if you're in a rut and you're, you're trying to write a screenplay or you're trying to come up with a new story idea, just do something you wouldn't normally do. Go out to a new place, uh, experience something, or, or, or do an activity you don't normally participate in just to try it, uh, it, it could inspire you. A lot of times what I would do is I'd go to see a really good movie and sometimes that would inspire me. Like, wow, that was a good movie. I gotta go home and write a screenplay. Um, you know, you, you, you definitely wanna watch good movies. Just like you wanna read good books if you're a novelist, you wanna watch good movies if you're a screenwriter doesn't mean you can't learn something from bad movies but if you watch too many bad movies like if you're a bad movie junkie it can kind of put you in the wrong mind frame of that you know unless of course that's what you're trying to write if you're trying to write you know purposely write a bad B movie or you're trying to write a parody of B movies uh, or a monster movie or whatever that's not very good and that's kind of what you're going for. Maybe, maybe that's research, but you don't want to do too much of it. Um, so once you have your, your premise, your idea, whatever it is, the next thing you want to do is, is get down to the, to the meat of what you you're actually need to accomplish to finish the screenplay. So what do you need? You need 90 to 100 pages, roughly, a minute a page. Okay, in the proper script format, which I'm not gonna go through here. You can look it up on the internet. You can buy a million books on it. I mean, buy, buy a, a word processing program or uh, there's some shareware online. It's called like Celtics or something. You, I, I, I used it once for a client. Um, it's not bad. It's, it's not my cup of tea. I, I got a copy of Final Draft that I use, which is it's pretty good. Final Draft 5 I have. I think they're up to like 8 or 9. Um, so get yourself a copy of that. Saves you the headache. You got to be in the right font. You got to use the right terminology. Maybe we'll cover that in another video, but it's really boring and easy to figure out. I mean, it just take 15 minutes to read, read a web page online. You'll figure it out. So that's number one. Um, what I like to do 
is once I have my premise, I'll write a little three act outline. So I'll have act one, a couple of things that, you know, the major events in act one, act two, major events in that, and act three, major events in that, and my ending, and any good bits that I have and where they might go. And I'll have that outline on the page, and as I, I'll write above it, and you know, the word processing program is just keep pushing it down, so I'll, I could always just scroll down and refer to it as I need it. And I don't tie myself to an outline. Don't, don't feel like you have to follow your outline exactly as you outlined it. Don't, don't trap yourself in your own outline. It's a guide. It's a guide to get you to start writing scenes. Um, Stephen King talks about writing a novel and how there's like a window of time you should do it. I believe that's the case for screenplays. You can overwrite them. You can overdevelop them. So, uh, you know, at minimum, do a page a day, right? At minimum, you should be done in about three months. And that's a long time for a professional screenwriter, unless it's a very, you know, unless it's a historical drama or something that, you know, really took place and requires a ton of research. It shouldn't take you 90 days uh, to write a screenplay, especially if you're doing like comedy or horror or, you know, even science fiction. I mean, there might be a little research in science fiction, just enough to get you up on the science of whatever it is you're writing about, but certainly in a drama, you know, it's not really about the things that would require research normally. It's about the interactions and dynamics between the characters. So that stuff you can just make up. Um, so you start with act one, introduce the characters. You know, you wanna establish a world that is real, that feels like it'll go on even if the events of the movie don't happen. So a lot of times in movies you'll see they'll set set something up that can only play out the way it plays out in the movie. Like why would the character do that if the surprising thing didn't happen in act two? You don't want to set it up that way more often than not. You want it to feel like a real world so it should feel you know random uh, to a certain extent. It should feel like other people are in that world and moving on with their lives even as the characters are uh, moving on with this important story. It kind of varies. You know, with comedies, you can tend to be focused on the just the main cast more. It doesn't have to be as open. Um, same thing with dramas. But, you know, in a, in, a, in a movie like, oh, you know, one of these movies that takes place, that, a drama, like, um, that Clint Eastwood movie with Matt Damon, Invictus, right? That was based on real events. Um, so you wanted to, to feel like a real world. Um, you know, you wanted to feel like when Morgan Freeman goes out for a walk as uh, Nelson Mandela that, you know, he's, he's may, maybe playing with fire a little bit. It's a little bit dangerous for a guy of his stature to just go out for a walk. He could be, uh, you know, harmed. Um, so after you finish act one, you introduce all the characters, you introduce the problem, uh, and you start to, you know, tell the audience that here's what the movie's going to be about. Act two should be a lot of the fun stuff that you expected to happen, right? So in the comedy, it's a, it's a lot of the crazy stuff. In, in a horror, it's more of the scares, you know, more of the murders or monsters. In science fiction, it, it's, you know, whatever it is. It's the planets or the robots or the Martians or whatever it is, more of that. It's more, more of your premise in act two, lots of it. And it should constantly up the ante and build to something, which is what act three is all about. Act three is all about the climax. You know, you, you're, you're at the, at the peak the character has come through this journey and act three is where everything happens. It's where the climax of the movie happens. It's where the character is changed by the events of the movie and uh, all the payoffs, right? 
And a lot of times what I'll do too, because writing is rewriting, is once you bang it out, then you go back and start checking what your foreshadowing is, right? So maybe you find yourself needing some extra characters in Acts 2 and 3, you can go back and add them in one so they don't feel like they just show up out of nowhere. So a movie with a huge cast like, uh, uh, like the recent Mad Max movie, let's say. You know, there's a lot of crazy, crazy characters running around. Uh, if you need some crazy characters towards the end of the movie that you didn't think of when you were first writing it, you go back and say to yourself, well, where could these guys be? You know, so when two and three roll around, they don't just show up out of nowhere. Okay? Um, so, then you finish up your first draft. And after I finish the first, first draft, what I like to do is I like to set it aside if I have the time, it depends on if I have the time or not. Sometimes I'm on a tight deadline for a client, don't have time to do that, but if I do, I will set it aside for as long as it takes to me to kind of forget about it. Not completely, obviously, that would take a long time, but I don't know, a couple of weeks. You know, get, get your head wrapped around something else and then when you're kind of feeling relaxed and you could look at it with fresh eyes, that's when you go through and you start, uh, you know, tweaking it and, and punching things up and looking at it like, what, what the hell was I talking about here? And then going back and fixing it so it makes sense to somebody, someone who's reading it. And of course, you got to check your spelling and do all the, all the, you know, due diligence of any writer. I'm a terrible speller, thank God for word check. Um, you also want to check your grammar. It's a little less important in a screenplay because uh, you could speak in sentence fragments a lot, even just describing things. Certainly the dialogue will be a lot of sentence fragments. Uh, so don't worry about that too much. Uh, but uh, obviously if you, if you, you know, screw something up in the description and it should clearly be a, a, a normal sentence, you should fix it. Then, after that, um, it's a good idea to have, you know, if you have some friends that can read your screenplay, that's always good, but you have to take their criticism with a grain of salt. Uh, it, it, it also depends on who they are. If they're, you know, reading screenplays is tough. Uh, uh, you know, executives hate it. Movie, everybody hates it. I, I know a few people who can read a screenplay and go, wow, that was fun to read. Uh, about the only ones I know off the top of my head is uh, Shane Black, the way he writes a screenplay. It's a, it's pretty fun to read, you know, because it's it's snappy. It's usually full of action and and jokes. So even the descriptions will have, you know, some snazzy, snarky stuff in it, which uh, which will make it easier to read. But ultimately, it's not meant to be an easy read. It's not a novel. It's meant to be instructions on how to make the movie. So. It's hard to, for instance, um, telegraph in a screenplay a surprise like you can in a novel. Because in a novel it comes out like it comes out in the movie. But in a screenplay, you know, the, the descriptions have to be concrete enough not so you surprise the reader, but so they can make the movie to surprise the audience. So there's a distinction there. And so unfortunately what will happen to a lot of clients is they read something and at first they love it, especially new clients, because it's, it's their ideas finally coming together. And they just love it. And, and they'll read it a few times and each time they love it. But by the fourth or fifth time, and certainly after they've talked to anybody else other than you, they'll start to sour on it and they don't understand why the novelty is wearing off. It just does. Um, you as a screenwriter have to rise above that because you know it's your job to recognize good scenes even if you've read them 15 times. It's your job to say to your client, no that's a good scene, you know you loved it when you read it the first two times now that you've read it the 18th time, you hate it, but it's still good. It's still new. Uh, that's another big thing. Do your research. 
And what I mean by that is if you come up with a premise of a movie, you should get on the internet and see how many other movies have a similar or same premise. You should see other movies in that vein. If you can't find any movies in that vein, then perhaps you're on to a brand new genre. I doubt it, but you know, it will be similar to something. And it's good to know what's gone before. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to do, I don't know, a, a movie about guys who fly jets in the military and end up rewriting Top Gun. Top Gun's already been done. You need to do something different. You need to see movies like Top Gun and the new Top Gun that they're making and whatever other, I don't know, Iron Eagle. And you need to see those movies so you can make, um, you know, take, take in those movies and make your movie even better. You can look at those movies and say, huh, what are they missing? You know, what did they just gloss over because they're Hollywood and they gloss over things? You could put in those details that make those movies look lame by comparison, right? You could maybe put in some more detail and explain things in a way that, you know, maybe other screenwriters ste stepped away from because they thought it was too complicated, but maybe you can come up with a way to explain, you know, some awesome, awesome detail. It's also true that as society progresses, the people in general become more attuned to certain technologies, right? Like, for instance, back in the 90s, people only knew so much about computers. I mean, they knew a little bit about computers. But I used to, I used to be an office temp and I would go in to a place in the early 90s and if I knew how to use WordPerfect, <laughs> that's an old program, WordPerfect, they thought I was like the IT guy. I mean, they, they would ask me questions about their com computer, like, oh my God, I, I don't know how my email works. Can you help me? But obviously now that's not the case. Now in 2018, pretty much everybody knows how to use computers. Everybody uses their phone. Your phone's a computer. Same thing with cell phones. There, were, there was a time period where people very confused by smartphones and how they work. Now everybody uses one. So there are certain things in a screenplay that you may not have to explain or that used to be too complicated to explain in a movie, but now, you know, you could just jump ahead, right? I always say that um, in the superhero movies, like in the Superman movies or the Spider-Man movies, they really ought to stop explaining the origin or do what Sam Raimi did in the, I guess it was the second Spider-Man movie, show just a montage at the beginning of the movie to remind everybody how he got his superpowers and then just move on. I mean, that's what you want to do, right? We don't need to see people get bit by radioactive spiders again, do we? I don't think so. So we can, we can sort of gloss over that and get, get to the story. You're wasting, you're wasting my valuable time, movie makers. Anyhow, so your process uh, you'll discover on your own, but force yourself to write. Bang out pages every day because you can always go back and rewrite them. I know you want to agonize over every word, but it's not a novel. It's a screenplay. And especially if you're going to be dealing with other people, and you will be, there's going to be some changes. It makes no sense for you to agonize over every word not in the early stages. Later when you're making a movie, maybe if you've got a lot of detail, but ultimately, you know, the actors bring something to the table, the director, the cinematographer, everyone brings something to the table and you have to acknowledge that it is a collaborative effort. So you don't wanna get too precious about any of your ideas. One of the things I, I always recommend to uh, starting screenwriters or writers really, especially comedy guys, you know, is to take improv classes. Because one of the things it teaches you to do is to grind through ideas, generate inspiration, and then throw the ideas aside when you're done with them and, and come up with new ones. If you get too precious on your ideas, you know, you're, you're, you're fighting over nothing, essentially. You know, because people at a certain point are just going to say no to you. I, I don't want to make your movie. You're too precious. Too precious on your ideas. 
um, you have to sort of get your, your, your foot in the door and, and get the damn movie made before you can get, you know, throw a little of your weight around and say, no, don't do it. Now, you could certainly make your voice known. You could certainly say, I disagree with that, you know, but you have to be diplomatic about it and say, well, that's not the way I would do it, but okay, let's try it your way. Because sometimes you'll be surprised at, at what a director will do. You know, maybe a scene that you love will be improved. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes actors will bring something to the table. And sometimes an actor is a, is a little different than you imagined. When you wrote the scene, you might, you might be thinking of a guy in your head, and then the guy they cast is a little different. So he kind of has to change the scene to make it work for his body type or what he looks like or what she looks like. You know, it, it may not totally jibe with your original vision, and that's, you know, it, it could be detrimental to the movie. I'm not saying it can't be ruined, uh, but it could also improve it too. So you have to keep an open mind when you're in this collaborative effort of making a movie. But as a screenwriter, your most important thing is structure, the format, getting the story done in that order. Because if you don't do those first two, they're not even going to read your story. If you do those first two, if you make it as easy as possible for them to make your movie the way you wrote it, they'll probably do your story the way it's written. You know? You're always going to have to deal with directors who have egos and producers and actors who have egos who just want to change things for the sake of changing them and getting credit. But you know, the guys who like to work, get movies done, get things done right, they don't want to change what works. If it's not broken, don't try to fix it. And if you get those kind of people and you have a screenplay that works, hopefully it's smooth sailing. Okay, so I hope today's screenwriting tips were helpful. My name is Tony D. I'm a screenwriter. You can also check out my web comics on the Webcomic Factory and Superfrat. If you like these videos, you can donate on my Patreon, and hopefully I'll be getting my subscriber star up and running soon, because I just found out about that. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions, especially about screenwriting, please leave a note in the comments. Thank you. See you next time.